Alarm Martin Scorsese. Blood on the Moon. It's a 1948 Western. I've always loved it, and film lovers today would describe it as a noir, a Western noir. This picture was very much on my mind when I was thinking about the film I made, Killers of the Flower Moon. The way that Robert Mitchum and Robert Preston were dressed, the way they looked in the frame, really was a direct inspiration for me and for Jackie West, who was the costume designer. But it was also a model for really how to approach the characters and their complicated relationships. There's a friendship between Robert Mitchum and Robert Preston in particular. They're very old friends. Mitchum seems to be in need of a job, and Preston, who's become a wealthy rancher, offers him one. And he appears uh, to be a really likable person. I know when I saw the film, I was six years old and left this major impression on me because of this relationship. Mitchum learns that Preston wants to help take over another herd by any means necessary. So what does he do? He keeps working for his old friend so he can eat and make a living. Or should he do the right thing and betray his friend? As I say, I vividly remember being a kid watching this picture and I thought that Mitchum and Preston were both so likable. Preston in particular had that music man feel about him right then. He was so winning. And when I saw there was a warm relationship between them, I was relieved. Because up to that point in the film, everybody seems to be actually very mean to each other. And for a child, it was very, very interesting because I was used to seeing Westerns that were more traditional in a way. This relationship builds throughout the picture and ultimately it comes into a confrontation and they get into a fight, this knockdown, drag out brawl between Mitchum and Preston. It's an exhausting fight. It seems to go on forever and it's very, very different from the choreographed fight scenes I had seen in other B-Westerns up to that point. And this was so upsetting to me as a child, so frightening in a way to look at. It was just like in my life when the people that I cared about fought. For me as a viewer, as a child, it was no dividing line. I liked both of them. And art and life went on in the same way. Now, Blood on the Moon was Robert Wise's first big production. And even though he said he didn't like the Western genre, he handled it beautifully. A lot of elements of what he did with Val Luton prior to this slip into this film. For example, there's a night stampede right at the start of the picture. And Wise staged this very economically. He set up on Mitchum at his campsite. He cut to shots of running cattle. Then he cut to Mitchum clambering up a tree. And that's shot from overhead, safe from the cattle below him. It's a very interesting film, very surprising picture, I think. Last of the Line. When I first saw it, I think I was about 18 years old. It was at NYU, and it really stunned me. The final, genuinely shocking image in particular. Now, many of the earliest Westerns featured crude portraits of indigenous people. They're almost always played by white actors in terrible makeup and wigs and stock company costumes, but this picture is different. Most of the indigenous characters are played by Oglala Lakota, who were brought down from Pine Ridge. And the lead role of the chief's son was played by the excellent Japanese actor, Sesio Hayakawa, who was a big star at the time. But the key role of the chief, which is really the heart of the picture, was played so eloquently by a man named Joe Goodboy. He was 80 years old at the time, and he was a born actor. Now, Ince also brought in experienced writers from the Miller Brothers' 101 Ranch Wild West show out of Oklahoma, which gave the film a further level of authenticity. The settings, the eloquence of the acting, the presence of the Lakota people, the extras who really know how to handle horses and firearms, this, this all makes a difference. Last of the Lion is such an unusual picture to come out of early Hollywood. Another unusual western is called Lady of the Dugout, and it was one of the first pictures directed by W.S. Van Dyke, or Woody Van Dyke. We went out to do a lot of films at MGM. Now, regular TCM watchers might know the 1951 Columbia picture, Al Jennings of Oklahoma, which starred Dan Duryea in the title role, and Dick Ferran as his brother Frank. Jennings had quite a life. I mean, he started as a lawyer, became an outlaw, and the leader of a actually pretty inept gang that robbed a few banks. He did quite a stint in prison. He was pardoned. And then he became a celebrity thanks to an O. Henry story and eventually made his way into movies. In this picture, Al and Frank Jennings played themselves. And the story is one of Jennings' fabulous tales of his outlaw days with elements of three godfathers and Robin Hood and that sort of thing. The most unusual aspect of the film made in 1918 is that it's told as a flashback. Jennings narrates the action in intertitles. Al and Frank are really both are quite interesting to watch. They're cool, reserved, stoic, 
As in Last of the Line, a lot of the acting is quiet and understated. The settings appear to be absolutely real, and the entire picture produced by Jennings was shot in Tehachapi, California, near the Mojave Desert. And actually, at the time, it sparked a backlash. There were other films produced that tried to debunk it, you know, from the beginning of cinema. And there's always been the accusations and the uh, discussion and arguments over the glamorization of outlaws. It's always been an issue. Now, like Last of the Line, Lady of the Dugout altered my perspective of the early Hollywood Western and what it could be. And I actually included a, a large clip from it in Killers of the Flower Moon. The Heiress, a film I've always loved. When I first saw it, I think I was 10 years old. I've gone back to see it many, many times over the years. It's immaculately acted and crafted. It's one of the finest films ever made about 19th century America. And it has this stunning score by Aaron Copeland. It's a psychological suspense story in which the tension is pulled tighter and tighter, like a bowstring, to a point where I think it becomes excruciating because it's so painfully real. You could really sense it. I saw it for the first time, I think I was 10 years old. As I said, I found it overwhelming. It was Olivia de Havilland who approached William Wyler about making the picture, an adaptation of Ruth and Augustus Getz's Broadway play, which of course was adapted from Henry James's novel, Washington Square. And when it came to casting Morris, the young suitor who courts de Havilland's wealthy Catherine Sloper, Wyler immediately thought of Elwer Flynn. Flynn refused it, and Wyler reversed course. So he wanted someone softer, who would keep you wondering, is Catherine's father, played so brilliantly by Ralph Richardson, is her father right? Does Morris really love Catherine, or does he just love her money? Or is it a little bit of both? So Wyler cast Montgomery Clift in the role, and there was tension between him and de Havilland. I mean, two actors with very different approaches to their craft. But this tension really seemed to add an emotional undertone, and it seemed to really ratchet up and fuel the dramatic suspense. Now, the heiress was a model for the kind of dynamic we were pursuing between Ernest and Molly in Killers of the Flower Moon, characters played by Leo DiCaprio and Lily Gladstone. Love? Money? Both? I mean, do we really know? Do they really know? It's the kind of thing that can happen between people, that sort of tangle of emotions and motivations. And it's expressed so beautifully and with such precision, dramatically and cinematically in this remarkable picture. 